Well, let's go ahead and take our Bibles, and we're going to be opening them today into uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. Well, Karen and I and our family, we moved here uh, just almost five years ago. And if you're an NFL fan or a Chiefs fan, the last five years have been pretty good to you. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, those last five years, uh, you know, listen, they told me it wasn't like that before. And so if you've been a Chiefs fan all of those years and you kind of come up to this point, well, these last number of years have been pretty amazing for you. Just a great run. In fact, three out of the last five Super Bowls since 2020. So good for you Chiefs fans out there. You're, you're living large. Uh, but here's the reality. Did you know that you could have actually um, started a little bit earlier? Did you know that? So in 2019, uh, you all are making your way, all of you Chiefs fans, the Chiefs are making their way through the playoffs in the 2019 playoffs, and everything was going really, really well. AFC Championship, you're up against the GOAT, Tom Brady and the Patriots, and everything is going well. And in that particular game, I don't know if you can remember all of this, but in that particular game, you go back, the Chiefs are up 28 to 24 with just over a minute remaining. Tom Brady's got the ball. Chiefs are on defense. Tom Brady lets go of the ball, and it goes to Gronk, bounces off his receiver, Gronk. Chiefs intercept it. And with just about a minute to play, everything looks good. And then you look, and there's this dirty little yellow thing on the ground, <laughs> and it's called a flag. The ref steps up, and the referee says, offsides. Defense, number 55, five-yard penalty, repeat, third down. That interception was wiped out. You gave Tom Brady a second chance. Tom Brady doesn't mess up second chances. And so in that last minute, he orchestrates a touchdown drive. Chiefs lose the AFC. Tom Brady and the Patriots go on to win a Super Bowl. Better luck next year, and indeed, you did take advantage of that in 2020, but it could have started a year earlier. And what happens when we're off sides? It's, it's when, when we're on the wrong side of the line, we're on the wrong side of the ball. And the reality is this, for many of us, there are times that we're going to be on the wrong side of things. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, for some of us, it may not be that big of a deal. For some of us, maybe you woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Have you ever been in that? situation, you wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Now, the consequences to that may not be uh, critical. Waking up on the wrong side of the bed, you might just be a little bit grumpy, but you're going you're to make it. And the people around you are going to make it if you wake up on the wrong side of the bed. And so maybe not such a big deal there. But what about when maybe you're not waking up on the wrong side of the bed? What if you're driving on the wrong side of the road? And if you're driving on the wrong side of the road, well, there certainly could be some consequences to that. As a matter of fact, when you drive on the wrong side of the road and you pass a policeman, you're going to be on the wrong side of the law. And so the truth of the matter is, is whether you are getting up on the wrong side of the bed or if you've lined up on the wrong side of the ball, you've driven on the wrong side of the road and you end up on the wrong side of the law, there's always these types of consequences that come when you are on the wrong side side. Some insignificant, some very significant. Well, today, just for the next few minutes, I want your attention because I want to talk about when you end up on the wrong side of the cross. When you end up on the wrong side of the cross, and unlike being on the wrong side of the ball or the wrong side of the law, when, when you are on the wrong side of the cross, there are eternal, significant consequences. Many times when we come to Easter, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we rightly should. But listen, in order to rise from the dead, there needs to be a death. And the Bible teaches us on that Good Friday that, that Jesus went to the cross, the cross of Calvary, the place of Golgotha, or also known as the skull. But for many of us, as we look, you'll notice that there are three crosses up here. The Bible tells us that it was Jesus Christ who went to the cross, but on that day, there were others that were being executed. And so here in the scripture, if you've got your Bibles, you'll notice here in Luke chapter 23, in verse 32, the Bible says this. It says, two others... 
who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him, that is Jesus, and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. So on this particular day, the gospel writers, these eyewitnesses, they they give attention to the fact that Jesus is, is being crucified unto death, but he wasn't crucified alone. There were two criminals, a company of criminals that he would be uh, executed with. There would be one on his right and one on his left. And what I want to do is just give our attention this morning to these three crosses and their significance and what it teaches us. And here's what I want you thinking about. You can end up on the wrong side of so many things, but you don't want to end up on the wrong side of the cross. Well, let's begin this morning looking at the center cross. This is the cross that represents the Lord Jesus Christ. You will notice here that it is draped in purple. Purple is a a symbol of royalty. And we know that people understood and people were, were giving Jesus the title as the king of the Jews. And here's what I want you to understand. No, he's much more than that. He's king of kings and Lord of lords. And Jesus Christ is the son of God who came into this world. And he lived a perfectly sinless life, a holy and a perfect life. And yet in this, this is where he ultimately ends up. He ends up on this cross. And why is it that Jesus Christ ends up on this cross? Well, this is where Jesus died for our sins. This is where Jesus died for our sins. Again, he was sinless. We are not. Jesus died for our sins. Now, what is sin? Well, in order to understand sin, we we need to go back a little bit. We need to go back not to just your creation, but the beginning of all creation. God has created this world, and God has created his creation and humanity to be able to have fellowship with him. And, And our lives have meaning and purpose to be in relationship with God, our creator. And God has a design for your life and a purpose for your life and meaning for your life. And God has designed us and created us for that very thing. And sin is when we go against God's design or go against God's ways. And when we do, what we find is this sin, it leads us astray from God and his purpose. This is what sin does. No matter what sin you commit, it ultimately leads you astray from God and his purpose. Now, in addition to that, not only does it lead us astray, but it also leaves us in a broken relationship with God. And that broken relationship with God also condemns us to hell. Nobody wants to talk about hell these days. But the reality is this, is that this sin that has entered into the world, sins that you've committed and I have committed, they they lead us astray from God. They lead us astray from God's purposes for us. And it also leaves us in a broken relationship with God. Because God is holy and he is righteous. And when we sin, we are not. And so that breaks that fellowship that God intended for you to have. And so with that being said, sin is a real problem. But Jesus is the real solution. And the Bible teaches us that that Jesus has died for our sins. In the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, the Bible says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous, that is Jesus, for the unrighteous. You want to take a guess who that is? That's us. It says, Christ has died for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Remember what I just said? Sin, it breaks that relationship that we have with God. It's a broken relationship that we have with God. But what Jesus has done on the cross, what is broken, Jesus brings back. That broken relationship, Jesus brings us back to God. You know, the Bible also says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24 that Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And so Jesus didn't go to the cross just to kind of set an example or to be an illustration. No, Jesus actually went to the cross to die for our sins and to carry the punishment and the penalty of our sin. You know, our sins, uh, it condemns us before a holy God. But Jesus says that condemnation, 
I'll carry it on my body, in my body, on the cross. Jesus says, I will do all of that. And so this center cross always reminds us here, this is where Jesus has died for our sins. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, in verse 2, that he is the propitiation for our sins. Big word. He is the propitiation for our sins. What does that mean? He is our sacrifice, our atoning sacrifice. And he has done that not only for us, but also for the sins of the whole world. Do you understand? We, we do not have a, a local savior or a regional savior or a national savior. We have a universal savior and his name is Jesus Christ. He's died for the sins of the whole world. There is never a person that's been born into this world that doesn't uh, fall under being a part of the whole world. And every person who has sinned, what happens? Jesus is the answer. He's the solution. He is the Savior. And I will tell you this. It's the greatest act of love in all of human history. The greatest act of love in all of human history. You know, the Bible says in Romans 5, 8 that, that God demonstrates his love for us in this way that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know what that means? Jesus didn't wait until you got your life in order. He didn't wait until you cleaned everything up for you to be acceptable to him. You know what he said? He says, even in your sin, the Father has loved you, I have loved you, and I have given my life while you're still sinners. And Jesus died on the cross. This is really significant. This is the message that we Christians must proclaim. That Jesus is the only Son of God and He's the only Savior of the world. He is the only solution for our sins. This center cross is where Jesus died for our sins. Now, as we read here in Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, it talks about these other two individuals that were crucified. Look with me, if you will, here, beginning in Luke 23, verse 39. It says, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man, he's done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So the center cross represents where Jesus died for sins. I want to take your attention over here to this cross. And here is the cross of one of the individuals that was crucified along with Jesus. This is the place where one died forgiven of his sins. I want you to notice here in these verses, there are three things that takes place with the individual that's hanging on this cross as he is hanging next to Jesus Christ on the cross and Jesus is dying for the sins of the world. This individual over, thing, over here, three things are happening in his life. The, the first thing is this, is he recognized his sinfulness and Jesus's righteousness. You remember these guys that are having this conversation back and forth. These, these criminals are kind of hollering over Jesus. They're having this conversation over Jesus being in the middle. Well, this one here, he, he recognizes uh, his own sinfulness, and he recognizes Jesus' righteousness and Jesus' holiness. He says this in verse 40, in verse 41, do you not fear God? Notice this, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But he says, but this man in the middle, Jesus Christ, he has done nothing wrong. And you say, first of all, maybe those are just some criminals having a conversation. But notice what he says. There is something significant here because as he's talking across Jesus to this individual, he says, do you not fear God? He's recognizing that there's something significant here, that, that this man is found with nothing being wrong, done nothing wrong, committed no wrong. He says, listen, I know that I am justly getting what I deserve, and I know that you're getting 
justly what you deserve. But Jesus in the middle, he has done nothing wrong. He recognizes the righteousness of Jesus, but he also recognizes his own sinfulness. Ultimately, say, what's he saying, Pastor? Here's what it is. He sees Jesus for who he is, and he sees his own sin for what it is. This is what's taking place here on the cross. Can I ask you this question? Have you recognized your own sinfulness in your life? Do you recognize the fact that when you are literally being lined up next to Jesus Christ, when you are lined up next to Jesus, you recognize that he is holy and righteous and you're not? And I'm not? So there's this aspect here where he recognizes his sinfulness and Christ's righteousness. And when you recognize your own sin, you say, well, wait a minute, pastor, I, I'm not a criminal. Listen, you might not be a criminal, but you're a sinner. You're a sinner. And I'm a sinner. You say, well, well, how can you be so sure? Well, the Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, if you are in the company of all people, would you just raise your hand to show that you're still with me? All right. If, if you're in the company of all the people, you recognize this. Well, this includes you. And the Bible says that we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Well, that's, that's tough news for us. But I want you to notice the second thing that takes place with this guy. He, he reached out to Jesus in faith. He reaches out to Jesus in faith. Uh, here, here's what he says. He looks at Jesus, and in verse 42, the Bible says, he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Oh, listen, so he does believe something about Jesus, doesn't he? If, if Jesus has a kingdom, what does he believe about Jesus? Jesus is king, king of king and lord of lords. So he said, Jesus, remember me when, when you come into your kingdom. I, I want you to just understand this. When, when he offers that before the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, Jesus, would you remember me when you're in your kingdom? He's just reaching out to the Lord in faith. He believes in this. He had nothing to offer Jesus in that moment but his faith. That's it. And he offers that to him. You see, it's only in turning to Jesus in faith can Can we find true forgiveness for our sins? And the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so when he reaches out to the Lord, he reaches out to the Lord in faith. And praise God, listen. And when he reached out to the Lord in faith, he was forgiven. This white drape represents the fact that that he has been uh, no longer condemned in his sin. He is now cleansed of his sin because of what Jesus has done on this cross. You see, Jesus died for sins. This man dies forgiven of his sins. And the third thing that happens here is he receives the promise of salvation from the Lord. He receives this promise of salvation from the Lord. Jesus says this. He says, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus says, I've got some good news and some bad news. He said, bad news, you're going to die today. The good news, I'm taking you to be with me. Hey, listen, when you come to the very last day of your life and you draw the very last breath into your lungs, do you know where you're going? Have you received the promise of Jesus Christ on your life personally? Jesus says, uh, today, I assure you, you will be with me in paradise. By the way, promises are significant. But you know what? In life, what happens? Sometimes promises are broken, aren't they? Have you ever broken a promise? Somebody ever broken a promise to you? Maybe that promise was broken because the person didn't have the authority to make that promise and carry it out in the first place. Sometimes people get ahead of their skis. They don't have the authority to do that. For other people, maybe it's that they have some authority, but they don't actually have the ability or the power to carry that out. Can I tell you this? Jesus has both the authority and the power to carry out his promises. And he does. He says, today you'll be with me in paradise. 
And so this man, what does he do? He recognizes his sinfulness. He recognizes Jesus' righteousness. He reaches out to Jesus in faith, and he receives this promise of salvation from the Lord Jesus. But, you know, sadly, not everybody does. Not everybody does. You know, the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, but not everybody does call on the name of the Lord to be saved. And that's where we give our attention to the other side of the cross. Here's a cross where this person is in their sin. This is where one dies in his sin. So Jesus dies for our sins. This man dies forgiven of his sins. And this man dies in his sins. You say, Pastor, how do you know how that turned out for him? Well, first of all, let me just simply show you how he responds to the situation in the conversation. In verse 39, uh, this criminal, he begins to rail at Jesus saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But you, you have to know what's happening here. Jesus is being crucified. These guys are having a conversation over Jesus. And this one starts to say, listen, if you are who you say you are, Jesus, if you're the Christ, save yourself and save us. And the Bible says there in the, in the English Standard Version that he railed against Jesus. In the Greek language, the word is he blasphemed Jesus. He had no respect for Jesus, no reverence for Jesus. He's this close to Jesus Christ. And all he can do is rebel against Jesus. And so he rails, he blasphemes, he has no room for Jesus, no belief for Jesus. He doesn't reach out to Jesus. He's, he's mocking Jesus. And it's in this moment that we realize where he is. Until the very end, he could not see Jesus for who he is, and he would not see his sin for what it was. And here's the thing. Because of that, the Bible says in John chapter 8 and verse 24, unless you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, you will die in your sins. That's the reality for all of us. And the truth of the matter is, is, is for each of us, when we think about what uh, the word of God says, we don't want to be on the wrong side of the cross. And for you, you've got to answer that question for yourself. But here's what I want you to understand. That decision for you is black and white. Jesus died for sins. This man died forgiven of his sins. This man died in his sins. What was the difference? He was willing to recognize who Jesus is, recognize his own sin, reach out in faith, and simply receive the promise of salvation from the Lord. Hey, let me tell you, this is Easter Sunday morning, and you may be sitting here saying, okay, uh, remind me again, what happens, Pastor, after Jesus died on the cross? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. You know, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 24 that God raised Jesus up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death that's why we celebrate easter listen i don't know where you are on your spiritual journey uh, for some of you man you eagerly came this morning to celebrate your salvation in jesus christ some of you maybe you got dragged here by a neighbor maybe somebody promised you an easter meal if you showed up with family i don't know your circumstances but i'm going to tell you this if you've got food invite me over no, let me tell you this, whatever reason you're here, whatever reason that the Lord has you here today, don't end up on the wrong side of the cross. Don't end up on the wrong side of the cross. You know, there's times in life you might end up on the wrong side of the bed or the wrong side of the ball or the wrong side of the road or the wrong side of the law. And all of those things won't matter in the big picture of things, but do not end up on the wrong side of the cross. You know, I want to encourage you, listen, to be able to just understand. You say, Pastor, how do I call upon the name of the Lord? How do I, how do, I do that in my life? Well, I, I want to just simply 
show you something here. These are going to be available uh, around the worship center on your way out. You'll see those in the foyer. You'll see those out here in our atrium. And this is just a little something that I wrote um, that we had prepared uh, just a couple years ago. And it's about salvation. And, and I want you just to listen here to the, the back. And this is just simply a, a prayer that kind of represents the heart of the person on the cross and the heart of a sinner that comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, somebody desiring for Jesus to be the Lord of their life. And you're not exactly sure how that starts out or where that comes from. Let me just show you the sample prayer. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. I want to turn from my sins and trust Jesus as the Lord of my life. That's repentance. That's turning to Jesus. And you want to follow him. And listen, if that just kind of expresses where you are and you've never come to that decision point in your life, maybe you, maybe you just in the quiet of your heart, you, you pray a prayer similar to this, just acknowledging your sin acknowledging who Jesus is, what he has done, and the salvation that he brings. And I would encourage you to be able to do that even before you leave. Just pray. Just trust. I'm going to invite our worship team to come and to make their way uh, here to lead us in a song of response. And I wonder just simply, in all of the people that are gathered in this room, I, I know this beyond a shadow of a doubt. There's someone here today that hasn't settled this issue. And maybe just in the, in the clarity of the presentation that you've seen here, you, you know this decision is black and white. There is no gray. There is no, I'm kind of a Christian. I'm kind of saved. You end up on one side of the cross or the other. And so if you've not settled this issue today, it just simply comes from offering that prayer, turning your life towards the Lord. And the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would that be you today? I want to invite you to stand all over this room, all over this room. We're going to sing a song of response here this morning, and I'm going to pray over this room, and I'm going to pray something very specific, that if you're in this room right now, and that is an unsettled matter for you, and you want to end up on the right side of the cross, when we're singing, I'm going to be standing down here at the front, not to embarrass anybody, I'm going to be standing down here at the front. And there may be those that are coming to pray at the altar steps. I want you to come and say, man, I want to be saved today. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ today. I want you to share that with me. You say, why? Number one, that we can celebrate with you as heaven celebrates. Number two, that we can encourage you in the next steps that you need to take. So, Father, I pray over this room. I pray for the people right now that really, really, really need to answer this question. What side of the cross are they on? Father, would you allow this to be a moment where they would recognize when they are on the wrong side of the cross. Father, we're all sinners, and the only thing that separates us is some sinners are forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ when they turn in faith to him. Other sinners just remain in their sins, condemned. So, Lord, we just thank you for what Jesus has done for us. And, and I pray that nobody leaves here today without the assurance that Jesus is the Lord of their life, heaven is their eternal home. Lord, I've prayed for this for many weeks leading up to this, and I'm praying even now, God, that you would touch the life of someone or many someones to respond to your word. Lord, I pray this today in Jesus' name.